Hi, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Adobe Live. Um, my name is Justine Kirkman. I'm the artist and owner of Winnie Weston. Um, I'm here with Ryan Hamrick. Hi, Ryan. How are you? How's it going, Justine? I'm oh, good. I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Um, so before we jump into what Ryan will be working on today, I just wanted to let you guys know to join the Adobe Live community, subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us at Adobe Live on Instagram for the latest streams, updates and more. OK, so now we got that out of the way. Let's jump into Ryan Hamrick. Ryan, tell us more about yourself. Show us some of your work. Sure. Hey, um, I'm Ryan Hamrick. I am a independent lettering artist, uh, primarily I do a lot of uh, branding and advertising work and stuff too. But um, yeah, I'm uh, based here in Austin, Texas. And, and, you know, we're going to talk about a bunch of cool stuff today. I've got my my site pulled up here. Um, with just a, a selected collection of things from my portfolio. Um, like I said, I do a lot of branding and stuff. But um you know, also a lot of uh, of custom lettering for, you know, magazines and advertising and swag for Adobe in this case here, you know, got some Adobe XD stuff. Ooh, things like awesome. that. So, um, yeah, so we're going to do a little bit of, of that kind of thing. Um, pretty much everything I do is is letter based and um, in some way or another. And so we're going to do some some fun letters today and kind of show you a little bit of my my process from beginning to end. Awesome. Well, jump into it. I just want to say hello to the chat. Hi, chat. Hello, Gary Oliver, Gareth PJ. Um, if you do have any questions for Ryan as he's working, please do not hesitate to write them in, in the chat. I will definitely let him know so he can answer some of them while he works. All right, Ryan, take it away. Right. Um, so first off, I want to start in Adobe Fresco. So um, Justine and I were just talking a little bit before we before we came on about uh, some of the the amazing magical things that uh, that happen when you're able to do every stage of your process digitally, including the initial sketching stage and stuff. So um, you know if you've tuned in to some of my my prior uh, Adobe Live guest spots. Uh, you might have seen me drawing on paper. Um, I think that I was the first uh, guest to kind of demand <laughs> that paper was brought in and everything for for my live. But, um, you know, thank you, Paco, for for accommodating me on that. But uh, but now, you know, we've got the the joys of, of working digitally on the iPad and having an undo button and all that great stuff. So um, <clears throat> it just makes a lot of things a lot faster and easier. And we don't have three days like we used to to um, to accomplish a, a project on Adobe Live. So um, <laughs> speed things up a little bit. So I've got just a, a blank canvas here in Fresco. Um, I just made it a, a nice 2500 by 2500 pixel square. Um, because ultimately what I want to do today is work on some artwork for an album cover. So, you know, those are, it's a square design, right? So, uh, so I've got this, I've got a black background. I always like working in uh, white on black when I'm sketching. Um, another thing that's not impossible, but not easy to do uh, analog on paper. So, um, I don't know, something about the, the contrast of it just makes things a little bit easier to see for me especially as far as like weight balance and things like that so that's my first tip that i always throw out there is um you know give it a shot if you've never worked uh in kind of like inverted uh color setup like this then um, <laughs> you know, give it a shot and see what you think about how it uh how it lets you see things a little differently so um, i've got a blank layer on top of, of top of that black layer right now and so what i want to do first is is go in and check out some of the the pixel brushes in here um, I've got some of my own brushes added in here. Um, you've got my Hamrick lettering brushes here. They are um, available on my site in the in the shop there. Uh, but what you can do is you can come through here. You can load up all your your Photoshop brushes. Any Photoshop brushes can be easily added into to Fresco. So I've got all mine here. And I might just kind of play around with some of the, the different ones that I have here and just kind of get a feel for what style I want to, to use for the lettering that I'm going to do. 
Um, mm -hmm. So one of my, my go-tos here, well, first of all, let me, let me draw a couple of guides here. Um, let me just and while you do that, Ryan, um, I do have a quick question for you. Yeah. As far as your favorite brushes, how do you how do you determine that for you? Do you like the smoothness of it, or like what is it that makes you go, okay, this is my favorite brush? That's a great question. Um, it really depends on what it is that I'm that I'm trying to make. Um, so, if it's you know if I'm doing a lot of kind of fine sketching and editing and stuff, I may want something that has a little bit more more play to it, um, a little more precise, but uh, you know, as far as texture and stuff goes, maybe a little bit less texture. Um, mm -hmm. So I can get in there and really kind of fine tune the details. Um, if I'm doing something that, you know, I'm kind of trying to lay down a very non-digital looking style, which we'll, we'll kind of do some of here in a little bit as well, um, then I may choose something that is a little bit looser and has a little bit, uh, more texture things like that so it looks a little bit more like an analog brush pen or you know a brush so um right now what i did is i just grabbed like a really clean um flat brush of mine and drew out some guides here and an another tip with fresco um what you can do i definitely couldn't draw a line that straight uh, maybe <laughs> after like 10 tries i could come close but right uh, one thing you can do is just when you drag out a line you just hold it at the end of it there it'll snap to a straight one um, or if you're trying to draw a curve, an arc, if you will, um, you can do that as well. And also a bunch of different shapes and things, which we can kind of play around with a little bit later. But um, so I've got those there, just a couple of guidelines. And I'm going to take this layer and drop the opacity so it's not so strong there. Mm. Just a little faint, faint guide there so that I can kind of have that so I can keep my things balanced in the right size. Um, and then I'll go ahead and put another layer on top of that. Um, and then let me come back in here to my brushes. Um, I also did a a set of brushes for Adobe um, not too long ago, a year year or two ago at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and they're available for free for download from uh, the Creative Cloud site. Um, oh, actually, I made a um, a special shortened link for it. Actually, if you guys want to check them out, they're all half tone based brushes. Right. So you can see um, this one here, bristle tone. Ooh. Some, some texture in there but then you get close it's all kind of like you've got some half tone um that's beautiful in there mm -hmm. and uh, let's see what's one of my other favorite ones here wavy tone ribbon this one's kind of got like a ribbon feel oh that's in beautiful. the shape of the brush so mm -hmm. yeah and then, uh, the, the half toning is uh is kind of that wave pattern but anyway yeah that you can grab those for free i've got uh, a link for those that i can share in a little bit as well um, oh yes please do yeah and then okay so i don't think i'm going to use any of the the half tone ones today because it's not really the vibe i'm looking for so let me go back to my my lettering brushes here oh um, annika said oh i love that me too girl uh, yeah, the, the, the half tone brushes yeah yes fun <laughs> uh, and the cool thing about what the way we did it with with Adobe on those brushes is they commissioned the the brush set from me, but then also uh, made a, a piece of artwork. And what you can do from the site is actually like open it directly into Photoshop, so you can see all my layers and how I how I built the artwork and everything, and, and kind of play around with it, mess with it, and change it yourself, and um, and then also just directly add the brushes right into your library in Photoshop too, which is is awesome. So um, very very fun. But uh, yes. so let me grab, so I've got this brush here. This is kind of a, a folded pen brush that I designed and I actually designed it to be more like a, like a folded pen, mm -hmm. uh, which in the analog version of it, you know, you've got two pieces of metal that, you know, you can kind of hold the ink in and usually you use it in a slightly different orientation than the digital version of it. But I love the texture of this brush, especially. So when I, Draw like this, you've got some some size variability here and transparency. And as you're laying it down, the harder you press, you know, the, the more the flow is going to put more ink down, or in this case, white ink. But uh, but yeah, so it kind of acts very much like a folded pen would. Right. Um, so what I want to do is the the piece of lettering that I'm going to be drawing today is the the phrase 40 under 40. Um, so 
I'm going to start just playing around with some of these brushes and do some lettering in various styles to kind of uh, see what I like best for that set of words and letters. Every every set of letters presents its own opportunities and challenges and everything. So depending on what you're working with, different styles can look better for different things. So let me just try and start drawing. Wow. Now, how did you get into lettering, Ryan? I feel like that is such a specific... <laughs> <laughs> um gift to have so i'm just curious like how did you get into that well um it was it was all pretty random actually i um <laughs> decided when i was like 27 that um i wanted to try being a designer <laughs> pretty much <laughs> um i was uh working in in retail management for a long time and then we relocated and i had to leave the job that I was at and I was uh, basically staying home with my kids and doing some freelance writing and things uh, from home. But uh, then I just uh, you know, I started to play around with design and I'd always kind of like had Photoshop and, and messed around in there and done things for family members or friends or whatever, but um, never anything particularly serious. And uh, I actually spent about the first six weeks or so, or six weeks, six months um, that I was trying to see what kind of future I might have in design. Uh, spent it teaching myself uh, web design, basically, like HTML and CSS and trying to figure that stuff out. Mm -hmm. um, and wasn't really thoroughly enjoying that. So <laughs> um, at the point, I think it was uh, it was on Dribble. I was just, uh, you know, kind of trying to get active on there and build some some relationships there. And I just started seeing some of this amazing lettering stuff that was happening on there that people were doing and it wasn't something that I'd really ever seen before mm -hmm. or, or noticed at least uh if I'd seen it I, I hadn't really caught my attention but for whatever reason in that moment at that time it really just uh just struck me and I decided at that point like okay I'm not really going to probably be able to catch up enough to really get ahead and stand out in in it. I'm getting ready to spell the word four instead of 40. <laughs> in uh, the web design <laughs> stuff, right? So, mm -hmm. I was just, you know, so starting from scratch and just so far behind. Um, and so I kind of saw lettering and typography as like a, a way that maybe I might be able to get to a point where I could kind of do something a little bit new or unique and, and uh, stand out a little bit more. So um, I just tried my hand at it and it was definitely not something where I found this thing that I was just naturally good at at all. It was very, very rough at first. Um, <laughs> and, but you know, the whole time that I was just failing miserably at that, I was having a ton of fun. So I decided, you know what, it's, it's not good. I can tell that at least, which is probably a good thing. <laughs> right. I know it's not good. Um, but this is really, really fun. So I want to, uh, spend some more time with us and see if there's something here. Um, and then that's what counts though. Yeah. The fun yeah. of it all is what really counts. Yeah. It was really rewarding. I, I loved spending the time that I was spending, like trying to figure things out and figure out what it is that I didn't know so that I could try and learn it. And, um, and yeah, I mean, it was just, it was just a ton of fun. So that I, that kept me sticking with it and, you know, the rest is kind of history. I'm just, just couldn't find anything else or didn't ever come across anything else that interested me more to pull me away from that. So I just went super deep. And, right. You know. And here we are. I will <laughs> say the chat is they are saying perfect lettering on the first try. Ryan doesn't need control command Z plus Z. Um, you pretty much have definitely mastered it. I don't know what it looked like when you first started, but it's looking good now. <laughs> it was bad, sure, I promise you guys. And all, all of it's like, uh, if you look on my Dribble or even my Instagram, I think there's a bunch of early stuff in there. I haven't taken it down. I haven't archived it. I just left it all there to, you know, it's kind of like a, a badge of honor to uh, to look back on occasionally whenever I feel like scrolling infinitely. Um, but yeah, if you want to look, if you want care to dive super deep and, and scroll for a while, it's all there and it's, it's pretty gross. So... <laughs> It'd uh, be a nice little motivator if this is something that you ultimately want to try and figure out yourself. No, I completely feel you. Like when I look back on um, my Instagram and I look, I look back on my earlier things of like, oh my gosh, that skin color, she looked green. Like what is going on here? 
it's funny to look back and then to kind of see the progress of where I am now. So I I love that you tell people to to just keep it, keep it on your Instagram just as a badge of honor where you could yep. look back. Yeah, something you can you can look at yourself and just be like, wow, yeah, no, I, if you ever want to really feel good about <laughs> where you're at currently, like just right. like, even <laughs> six months ago, right? And just be like, okay, yeah, at least I'm progressing uh, from there. <laughs> right, exactly. Um, John White has a question. He said, yeah. um, have you ever tried music clefs or notation? Um, Like actually like drawing them and stuff. I, I, uh, definitely can't read music really or uh, write it in that in actual like musical notation. But um, I have, oops, I have drawn it uh, occasionally just uh, for fun or as a piece of a design or something like that, but not to actually like represent an actual piece of music, I don't think ever. So mm-hmm. it could be kind of fun. Um, and if I, if that wasn't your question or what you meant, by all means, let me know. But uh, yeah. Yes, John, if you want to clarify, did you mean um, drawing or or actually reading the, the music? The so one thing I just did with this guy here is uh, the way that I wrote it the first time, the F was a little bit uh, far away from the rest of it since I mm-hmm. kind of did it in a separate stroke and um, I wanted to move it a little bit closer. So, you know, all I did and undo here, I just grabbed my... Um, kind of like the lasso tool here and just drew around that that F since it was kind of still disconnected and didn't overlap with any of those stuff. It made it kind of easy. Sometimes you got to really get, get in there and get surgical with them to to break something apart and, and shift things around. But another great reason to do things digitally in this stage rather than on paper, it's a little lot harder to do that with paper. I have literally mm-hmm. cut out uh, chunks of different lettering pieces from <laughs> paper and piece them together and then trace them again but uh yeah this makes it a a heck of a lot easier oh yeah for sure oh um he said a treble clef oh a treble clef um yes specifically that one i have have drawn it it's it's funny because it's uh it's so close to an ampersand right Mm -hmm. um and i actually have one Oh, wow. You have one on your literal body. Very, very old. Um, but I did actually draw that one uh, before I ever decided to be a designer or a lettering artist. I think it was actually 18. So way, way before any of that. But um, yeah, so I actually um, am super into music and have been making music and, and playing around with with that form of creativity as well for for most of my life also so really yeah, I've, uh, played with as well treble clefts very good and i actually thought about trying to get this one since it's the actual quality the tattoo is very very bad um <laughs> i thought about getting it covered up with an ampersand but um now i've i've actually been spending more time playing around with music again so i thought well maybe maybe i'll just get, get covered up with a, a better looking <laughs> ampersand instead or not ampersand but the treble clap treble clap uh-huh yeah now what kind of music do you like listening to i know you can create the music but what kind of music do you like listening to i listen to all kinds of stuff um so mostly probably a, a, a large majority of it being hip-hop and, and r&b stuff but um nice. I, I like all kinds of music um anything that's that's well written well made um is you know, has a, a very good chance of, of getting on my radar and, and sticking around for a while. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I listen to a lot of stuff, not country so much, um, especially, you know, newer, newer things or things from the last couple decades, at least, uh, you know, some of the older mm-hmm. singer songwriters and stuff that were country artists uh, were really, really talented. And then, but even there, you know, it's, it kind of comes back down to the, uh, the songwriting and, and stuff that, uh, really hooked me more so than the the style of things, you know, so. Right. Someone said, do you listen to, and I might butcher this name, forgive me, please. Portishead? 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 Portis, a Portishead. There you go. I don't. Oh a bunch. Um, I have heard them, yes, but that is uh, is not one that I listen to a lot, at least for sure. Gotcha. That's so funny. You um, live in Austin, Texas, but you don't listen to a lot of country music anymore. Yeah. <laughs> or you listen to the to the older ones. 
yeah 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 like if it's like, like uh if it's dolly parton or willie nelson or right Johnny mm-hmm. Cash, that's a, there's a lot of a lot of good stuff in there but yeah not a, right other stuff but. gotcha and and for the chat I would just like to know who you guys listen and listen to. So definitely write that in the chat. I'm just curious. <laughs> so I've, uh, I've, I've drawn this F here and I'm going to create a new layer to write the rest of it. So that way, like sometimes I like to um, build even like a single word, sometimes even a single letter uh, when I feel like it's necessary, but build them in, in multiple layers just from the jump. So I don't have to try and separate things to adjust or or whatever and, and a lot of times initial letters especially will do on a separate layer from the rest of the word just because size and spacing with the rest of it um, tend to be things that I like to change quite often so I'll sometimes do them in, in different layers so I can have a little bit more freedom to just immediately manipulate those things so and gotcha. this I'm using now is one that I use so often that I literally didn't even try to come up with a clever name for it. It's just <laughs> Hammer Gink. Um, <laughs> these, uh, these series of brushes where it's Hammer Gink, uh, Hammer Gink Flat, and Hammer Gink Solid. Um, I didn't even, you know, that they're just, they're basically like my super versatile, like kind of all applications kind of tool. Um, it's got some texture, it's got uh, a lot of size variability with pressure. But um, mm-hmm. it also has uh, some other features that I can kind of point at when I'm or point to when I'm re- refining things a little bit here. As I'm doing this kind of first pass at some of these letters, it's got um, it's got jitter that increases when with pressure. So, for mm-hmm. instance, in the brush settings in here, as I go to say the scattering. Oh wait, where is it? Shape dynamics. There we go. Um, so size jitter angle jitter you've got all this control over these things but in scattering um i've got it scattering eight percent but with the control of pen pressure so what that means is as i press harder it scatters a little bit more and as i press lighter it's it's not scattering near as much and it's a lot more of a a smooth um exactly as i'm putting it down line so that way as I'm kind of doing initial passes and stuff like I'm doing right now, I get a little bit more of that jitter and that scattering rather. Um, and what that allows me to do is I can keep the, it's, it's kind of tough sometimes to draw digitally, right? You're drawing on a glass surface. I personally don't like to use like um, screen protectors. Protectors, or like okay. Make things like a matte finish. I just mm-hmm. kind of got used to drawing on the glass, like <laughs> when the iPad first, came out with the pencil and everything mm-hmm. um, and so adding something to that kind of uh you know just it would throw you off right to me yeah and so but there, there's challenges with that sometimes it's it's difficult to to do something exactly the way you want to or as smoothly as you want but instead of just letting myself be distracted by how imperfect the the smoothness of these edges are or the the smoothness of the transition from heavy to to light Instead of being distracted by that, I built in some some scatter with the pressure so that it kind of masks the impurity of that. Mm-hmm. So as I'm doing this here, if I got really close, you can kind of see that it's probably not the absolute sm- smoothest curve. But because of the way that I've got the texture and the scattering set up, I can't really see it as well when I'm doing this. And it lets me kind of keep moving instead of focusing too much on trying and trying and trying. It's a stroke like a bunch of times because it's not perfect. Because maybe I could get it there, but chances are maybe I couldn't. And it's just going to be too distracting and slow me down. So, Right. We actually have a question for you. Um, John asked, is there a reason you always approach at an angle? Oh, so I guess um, how you're drawing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Good question. Um, I think that it is worlds easier to uh, do, especially slanted uh, script lettering at an angle, um, just because when you're when you're doing it this way, it just kind of is a more natural angle for for your hand and your arm, just like you would with a piece of paper on a desk. Um, I always joke that 
those videos that you see sometimes that are like a a um what's the word i'm blanking on like a, a time lapse of somebody doing an, uh, an art piece or something and they've got the paper perfectly straight the entire time under the camera and they're just like working with it right there i think those people are you know some level of of crazy i don't know <laughs> not being able to turn my paper uh as i'm like sketching and stuff is just is unfathomable to me i've tried it before it's it's very very difficult um and getting kind of an angle so that you can uh, you know kind of naturally get your your slant going on on especially script letters like this is is wildly helpful and not only that but like as you're doing this and kind of like a the way that i'm doing it in kind of a calligraphic writing style here um mm -hmm. it's easy to kind of have it so that the the slant of the letters is kind of generally straight up and down um but for all different kinds of elements and things that i'm doing i'll turn it all different kinds of ways too which we'll see here in a second because i like if i'm going to cross this t for instance i may not want to do it the same way that i've written all the letters mm -hmm. maybe i could but I may want to kind of turn it all the way this way. Oh, wow. For whatever reason, that angle feels feels better to kind of get what I'm looking for or to approach a specific shape in the way that um, it just feels more natural to me, right? So, and it has to do with, um, you know, kind of the, the natural pivot of your, of your wrist and stuff too. So like if I'm doing a curve that is this way, since I'm, since I'm right-handed, it makes more sense for me to do that upright, right? If I'm doing a curve that goes the other way, my hand doesn't pivot that way. So right. it's it kind of hard to to do that. I may just turn that sucker upside down and do it that way so that I can get that curve oh. a little bit more, more perfect the first time because that's the way my hand works, right? So if I'm doing, even if I'm doing like cleanup and sketching in tiny little bits, um, if I'm coming into like this F, for instance, here, this curve right here is, you know, a little bit, leaving a little bit to be desired. So if I wanted to clean that up, I wouldn't come to it from this side and try and sketch here like this. Let me undo those. I would definitely want it to be on this side for that same reason. So that when my hand pivots, it's kind of making that curve already. Right. A natural it's curve. Easier to, to clean that up in the way that I want to. And here is a demonstration of the way that this brush in particular is good for things like this, because as I'm making these light little short strokes, you can see that the the detail is a lot cleaner because it is not scattering as much with this light pressure. Mm. I can kind of get a cleaner edged look than if I'm doing a lot of pressure. I got a lot of, of texture on the side there. Whereas if I'm doing short ones, the texture is still there, but my edge of my stroke is actually a lot more constrained and, and not scattering as much. Right. Wow. I love watching that process. So yeah, that's kind of like uh, the reason that I designed this particular brush was <laughs> specifically to kind of have that versatility so I could kind of take the first pass and get a lot of contrast and stuff with my my size and everything with with pressure and then uh kind of come in and, and fine-tune the details without having to switch brushes to something else that's uh that's got a little less going on it's kind of doing it all for me so uh yeah so that's it's really helpful i think i want to go back yeah um john actually has another question um he said any suggestions for staying within lines other than maybe increasing the zoom level? Staying within lines, like, um, you know, kind of, I'm assuming coloring something in or filling something a little bit more. Um, yeah. So John, are you saying um, staying within the lines um, where you're coloring something in or kind of what Ryan's doing where you're kind of just freehanding it, but you're wanting to, um, you know, stay within what you've already created or started to draw. Um, he said, as you were outlining the letters. Got it. Yeah. So um, with that, it's it's kind of just, it, it really does depend on what it is you're trying to do. In that case, I was trying to kind of perfect a curve. So instead of staying within what I was, what I was doing or what I had already put down, I wanted to actually 
kind of flesh out a little bit more of that that side of that shape um, to make it a little bit more smooth of a curve. And so at the top of it, I didn't want to get outside of where I was, but at the bottom, it kind of went in a little bit too much for, for my taste. And I wanted to kind of bring that side of it out a little bit more to kind of smooth out that curve. Um, and so with that, getting in close with the zoom that the, you know, iPad gives us on that in that regard is is super helpful for sure. Just so you can kind of like, you know, you can move a little bit more with your with your pencil in your hand and, you know, make a mark on less of the the area, right? But if you're doing that on, on paper or something, for instance, um, there are a couple things you can do for sure. There are some tools that that I have from when I did more uh, in the analog world on paper, like uh, eraser shields. Um, like uh, if I had a, a curve I wanted to clean up, there's these little metal eraser shields that you can get that have like different curve shapes and, and stuff that you can actually put on your artwork at the edge that you want to refine and mm -hmm. actually like erase a uh, part of the, <laughs> the curve there and mm -hmm. clean those things up. Um, but you know, digitally it's uh, zoom is, is a really great way to do it. Also kind of the, the brush that you're using, the size of the brush um, in this case with, with this brush, like I was mentioning, when you're making really light, uh, light pressured, that is not color, <laughs> light pressured strokes, um, it's this particular brush is, is doing that a lot more cleanly with less, less scatter. So um, you're able to kind of control exactly where you're putting it down. Um, another way that, that can help, um, I kind of go back and forth on what my preference is with this, but, and it's kind of hard to see here with the, uh, with the setting on to show my touches on here, but, you can turn on or off the um, the brush stroke uh, or the sorry the brush shape in in fresco for instance. So when you're coloring, you can see actually right there my my brush shape. Mm. See that outline there. So I'm like doing crazy uh, shape right now to to demonstrate it, but um, you can kind of see where that is. So that can be helpful sometimes to kind of know where your edge is going to be as you're moving along. Um, and you can turn that on and off. I think it's off by default. So um, if you don't didn't realize that something like that was there, that could be super helpful. Um, you can also choose a crosshairs like you can like in Photoshop um, if that feels a little bit more precise to you. You know, with the kind of textured and, and shaped brushes like this, it's the crosshairs is a little less helpful because it could be you know where you're actually marking could be you know anywhere around that depending on what the shape is. But um, yeah, that can be really helpful for, for kind of knowing exactly where you're going to be drawing. And at the end of the day, you know, you, you've also always got undo, so you can try it, try it, try it, try it, try it. And if it's, uh, if it's not the way you wanted it to be those times, keep on trying, you know, keep undoing right. it, and get it till you get it right. Uh, but yeah, Zoom is definitely your friend and things like this for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, I think Lauren asked, but how do you vectorize them? That is something we're going to talk about uh, in a little bit for sure. Because okay, perfect. Is, um, oh yeah, I, I forgot my um. Oh wait, my clock did update. Is it correct? No, it's still off. I don't know why. Yeah, pardon my iPad time. It's uh, it's getting closer to real, but it's <laughs> still not. Apparently. I was looking at it like, oh, it's only twelve thirty. Wait, no, we didn't. We started at twelve thirty. That's not right. Um, right. <laughs> so uh, we're going to be moving from here into Illustrator, actually. And we will talk about how I vector things just like this. Um, okay, so actually I want to do that differently. And I'll do things a lot of times uh, in a weird and kind of confusing order sometimes just because with different letters, you've got different things, different parts of them that are going to either conflict with each other or present an opportunity for a fun interaction between each other, things like that. So mm -hmm. in this case, I've got a T. And I've got a Y, both of which have fun elements that could either be annoying and a problem or, you know, could be really fun to play with. So I've got the, the crossbar of the T and I've got the descender of the Y. So I want to kind of do something maybe fun with those. So I'm kind of leaving them off here. Mm -hmm. you I also, in this case, like started with the second letter instead of the, the main initial letter. Um, so I'm getting a new layer here, and I'm going to do my F here. 
fairly well. That guy right there in the middle is a little wonky, but we can fix that. Um, and then I think what I want to do maybe is combine the top of the F with the crossbar of the T. So let's see if I can do that in a fun way here. And again, I'm turning my turning my canvas here sideways so I can do this this cross. Um, anytime, just another general tip for drawing period, letter, whether it's digitally or analog, whatever the case may be, whatever shapes you're trying to draw, it's always easier to pull the pencil or the pen or whatever you're doing than to push it um, if your mm -hmm. goal is to get you know smooth strokes and things. So I wouldn't want to probably do it up or, you know, I could do it down from this way too, obviously, but um, the way that I do it, I, I almost thought about trying to uh, make this more difficult with a, a second camera to point at my <laughs> actual iPad so you could see what I'm doing with my hands and everything too, which could be interesting for a future one. But um, what I want to do with this one is I'm going to turn it sideways here and I'm going to pull to get, um, you know, kind of the smoothest stroke that I can get. So I'm going to start on the right side of the T over here and come mm -hmm. down to this side over here. Um, and I'll get rid of those and see if I can kind of make, so if I can cross that T and finish the F with the same stroke here. Something like that maybe. Oh, wow. Good work. Mm -hmm. Another Pro tip for um, for lettering specifically, especially script stuff, um, but really any kind of typography, um, wherever possible, you want to try and limit the areas where you cross um, heavy areas of two different letters. Um, anytime there's a, an intersection, like for instance, with the crossing of the T um, or this intersection right here, you want to avoid having too much weight um, at that intersection on both um pieces of it both of the things that are intersecting so if one is is heavy in that area you want to try and make it cross at a point where it's it's lighter on the other the other shape um otherwise it just kind of optically it makes it look very very heavy in that spot even if they're the same same weight and everything as everything else in in the piece um that spot is going to really stand out and feel a lot heavier or darker as it's uh, called in the terminology in that spot and you want to avoid that so anywhere you can you want to try and make sure that it, it's smaller where the things are going to intersect and that's why when i drew this one i kind of made it a little bit lighter in mm -hmm. here on the on the cross bar of that t because the main weight of the t lives right there in that in that downstroke so right uh, yeah so we want to keep that in mind always um, okay so now i've got my f completed a little bit more and now I want to finish this Y. Now there's not a ton going on down here underneath the word. So I may try and use the descender of my Y to kind of fill a little bit of that space in a, in a creative way. Mm -hmm. So I might kind of zoom out a little bit here so I can see a little bit more of the overall shape and kind of judge based on that, how I, how I end up doing this. So. Coming Hello back. to the chat, um, to everyone who's coming in just now. We are here with Ryan Hamrick, and he is working on um, showing us how to do lettering in Adobe Fresco. Uh, so yes. Hello, chat. I'm repeatedly undoing here because there's different elements of each one of those attempts that I didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to try and get get fairly close to to this area up here, the, this baseline. Mm -hmm. But I also, I don't love how much space I left over there. So a lot of times- Oh, time, you're trying to fill the space. Yeah, I'm trying to really kind of uh, create an overall shape with this with this word. Um, that gives me a little bit uh, more appealing of an overall shape to it. Okay, so I kind of like how I did that as far as this area goes. It's kind of like evenly spaced from from all those other elements of the letters. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want to do something more with this guy over here. So, oops, I don't want to do that. I like it. I want to keep it. <laughs> all right. So let me erase some of this part that after the intersection here. Mm -hmm. Let me do that. Um, oh, I always forget. One of the the cool tricks you can do in 
Fresco that I'm not familiar with it being a thing in any other apps is that if I've got my, my special brush that I've created and made for myself that I love to use and use like 95% of the time, um, I can always set the eraser to also be that brush, but I can also keep the eraser function to be something else if I need to. And instead of actually switching to the eraser, what you can do is you can hold the kind of action button here mm -hmm. and then erase with that same brush. Wow. It doesn't matter what brush I've got eraser set to, I can erase it, especially helpful with uh, with brushes that have a lot of texture like this. Or, I was just about to say. Mm -hmm. yeah, you want you don't want to erase with that clean eraser edge like I like it did there when I did it the first time. Um, I want to erase with some of that texture so that especially like a place like this, I can really yep, get it just keep it keeps that texture, that line. Yeah. Versus like all of a sudden you have a clean line. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, like a smooth line really weird and be really if, if nothing else it's going to be distracting for me again like, which is uh motivation for a lot of what i do and i'm drawing is like stop distracting yourself i'm right I'm <laughs> enough like, i don't need any help being distracted from what i'm doing and uh <laughs> getting lost in the details here especially at a stage like this i just want to move forward so right uh, what i want to do with the other side of this this why is i want to kind of try and balance it with um with what's going on over here mm-hmm uh, so what I want to try and do is I'm going to try and do a shape that's sort of similar to that over here, kind of like in the opposite way here. So I've got that part erased. I'm going to come over here. Um, Rob in the chat has a question for you. Um, they say, Ryan, which letter artists are on your radar? Hmm. Let's see. I have, have always been a huge fan of uh, Ken Barber from House Industries. Uh, is handle is type lettering everywhere. Um, he's been an awesome mentor and, and friend across my whole journey from back when I lived in Pittsburgh nine years ago now, I guess. Um, and he's just incredible at, at any and all letter styles and, and techniques and everything and, and just an awesome guy. Um, I actually learned a lot of what I learned from uh, studying the books of Doyle Young, which I always make a point to recommend when I'm on an Adobe Live, just because it's like, you know, especially being self-taught in this kind of stuff, that those books at that time especially were just wildly uh, fundamental to how I was able to, to learn this thing that was really not very well documented anywhere else, especially before the days of uh, the pencil, before yeah. the days of uh, <laughs> Skillshare and Adobe Live and all that stuff. Right, right. Um, so those books were were huge uh, for me. So it's, it's if you're not familiar with them, it's spelled like Donald but with a Y, Doyle, mm -hmm. uh, and then the last name Young. Um, he's got several books out. Uh, he's he's passed now, so he's not really on my radar, I guess. Um, <laughs> to speak of but uh but yeah i mean there's there are a ton of i, I think i've actually still got on my site um a list of lettering friends and everything um and people to to definitely check out if you're if you're into to learning this stuff uh martina floor is uh is another uh, mm -hmm. person i've had the, had the pleasure of meeting and becoming friends with over the course of my career who also has a couple books out that are really, really helpful um, and a lot more instructive. Uh, Doyle's books are mostly kind of like incredible portfolios of his very prolific career and everything, but um, mm -hmm. with some nuggets in there that are really helpful in, in trying to learn things. But Martina's are actually um, specifically about like learning lettering. Um, and Ken has a book as well, too, that is very, very uh, helpful and, and instructive in lettering as well. But um, yeah, those are kind of just some of the two off the top of my head. Um, mm -hmm. I'm actually, I was having trouble um, getting something that I really liked that matched the other side. So what I'm going to do here is actually another uh, fun tried and true trick that I like to use uh, when drawing digitally. I'm going to take, let's see, I think it's this layer. No, I was going correct. That layer. Okay, so I'm going to duplicate this layer. Boom. And I'm going to... Rotate it. Oh. 
I'm going to bring it over here and reduce the opacity so that I can kind of use it to have underneath as a guide while I'm drawing this other other shape here that I want to roughly match it. It doesn't need to be perfect, but I do find sometimes that it helps to just have it there so that I can kind of have a general idea of what I'm, I'm trying to match. And I'll kind of get it in a better spot here. Right, as a guide. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's there. All right, now I'll go back to is this layer. Yep, okay. There's one downside of uh, working in white on black is that your your layers over here are the, uh, these guys are a little less helpful. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. because it's, like you really can't see it. Yeah, um, <laughs> I have to like put. I don't know what would work. I was going to say put black under each uh, each lettering on each layer, but maybe that would hide all the other ones. Now, do you use the black for um, any type of color you are? Uh, creating letters in so let's say you're um you know the lettering should be black are you then going to use white just to have that contrast or are you going to start with the white on top of the black and then switch it as depends. you know when you're done um, yeah it depends I, I, sometimes i will I, I will usually often start um at least in the stage where i'm playing with ideas and just kind of uh iterating and, and trying to figure out what it is that I want to do roughly I'll start this way even if I know for a fact that ultimately it's going to be you know inverted from that mm -hmm. um, sometimes that will present a problem like I feel like I I can't properly gauge how this is going to look unless I work in it in, in the way that I know that it's going to ultimately be a lot of times I don't know um, when starting out what the the breakdown is going to be or like how it's going to be applied and, and, and whatnot. But, um, if I do, then sometimes I will, I will kind of break from this, this routine, but, um, usually, especially at the very early stages, this is really, really helpful for, for me personally. So I'll start this way. And then as soon as I've got even like a rough idea of where I'm going to go, then maybe I'll switch, um, to, to doing it in a different way, but, uh, it's a really good question. Yeah. I think, um, you know, it really, as with most things kind of depends on you know the specifics of the the situation and what uh, makes most sense but mm -hmm, mm -hmm. all right so now i've got that there so then we can kind of better gauge about the size and shape that i want it to be closer yeah that was that was beautiful though thanks i see where you're going with it and just for the chat if you would like to nominate yourself or somebody else you know to be a guest on Adobe Live, um, submit your recommendations for creatives in the tab on Behance. At least I don't think I've heard that before on Adobe Live. That's definitely cool because that's uh, I'm pretty sure how I first got uh, asked to do this was on the recommendation of somebody else. So Really? Yeah. I sure. love that. So please chat. Definitely recommend somebody so they can be up here and we can see their creative process. Yeah. It's so fun to see how other people do things, especially when you're mostly self-taught. Like there's a lot of things sometimes where you just, uh, you don't know if you're doing it the smartest way or the best way. You're just kind of doing it the way that you <laughs> happen to figure out for right, yourself. Right, you're like, this feels good. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you can see the way somebody else does something and you're like, oh, you're right, that makes right. a lot more sense. <laughs> yeah, that, I was wasting so much time doing it. Right, you know, no, life. that is so true. Even um, you talking about kind of starting off with a, with a black background and you know, kind of just trying that out. I think I'm going to try that out just to see how it is. Um, even though, you know, I'm more fashion illustration and you're lettering, but I think the concept is still, um, can still work just in general. So I think it's, I love love it. yeah, I mean, to yeah. see it's just like totally not for you. I imagine it's probably very subjective and like not for everyone, but uh, especially for things like, you know, very vector based illustration or things like that that are kind of like really stark uh differences in like you know your positive and negatives like it can be really helpful to kind of see um 
spacing and, and size and balance and stuff in a, in a different way. Um, or even just like, right. if, you're, if you don't like end up working that way exclusively like me, or even <laughs> often, like it can be a good tip, like in the, in the process to like, just invert something so you can see it a little bit differently. And maybe you just use that as like a, a little gauge along the way to kind of like check in and see how things are going with spacing and, and maybe it'll present things to you that you didn't see the other way. Um, mm -hmm. it can be helpful for just kind of like switching back and forth to kind of like check out those things and then kind of come back and, and, uh, fix little things that might've popped up at you didn't see before. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got this area in here that feels a little empty. I'm going to change my R in a way that let me fill that space a little bit. So I'm going to kind of erase some of this connecting stroke here. Rob said, I love the chalkboard look and feel of it. Yeah. <laughs> so do you determine um, what type of brush um, based on the feel you want this to have? So for this... 40 um lettering or word did you want it to have like that chalkboard or not vintage but you know that type of feel um not necessarily um sometimes that is that is kind of like part of the the process and, and the goal to like see how it's gonna ultimately be um in this case specifically um i'm going to be drawing this in vector so um we're not going to focus as much on the texture in this mm -hmm. one. Um, if, if I'm leaving something not vectored or if I'm just, you know, redrawing in vector and like trying to incorporate some texture and things like that, um, then maybe I might try and do it more in the style of the way it's going to be. Really, most of this, this process on something like this, this style of lettering, it's mostly just that thing I mentioned before of like, avoiding distracting myself and having that texture in there and the, the little bit rougher edges can often be super helpful in just kind of letting me get the ideas out. Um, and so that's kind of where where I'm at with something like this, because ultimately I'm going to be drawing it in, in vector. I think everybody can probably relate to having drawn something on pencil and paper stuff, especially, and really, really liking it and then drawing it just about exactly the same way in vector and it's lost some magic right, right. like it's uh, without the texture or without like the hand-drawn edges it's like it doesn't feel as good for some reason all of a sudden mm -hmm. um and so that that difference in the way something looks or feels in vector and with those super precise clean edges compared to a sketch um is kind of part of what I'm trying to avoid in the experimentation process so that I don't get too hung up on the balance and, you know, the weight of things and whatever. And I can just kind of see where I want to go. Um, and so that I actually really like, I'm probably just going to kind of stick with this one iteration of 40 for time's sake. So we can kind of talk about some of the, the other stuff. Um, okay. But uh, yeah, so let's see, what do I want to do here? Do I want to? And I have a couple of questions for you, hmm. Ryan. Um, one peg asked, what happens to the texture when you change the color? Oh, let's see. So I've got this layer. So I just combined uh, all those layers. So now everything is on the same layer. Let's see. I like red. Let's do this. I just do that. Mm. So all this texture is, it's not like, um, like when you bring in a, a textured image into to Photoshop or something like that, where you can have a lot of issues with like transparency or you know, things like that, the different grays and then not picking up things as well. I mean, this is just various levels of transparency uh, of white on, on the black for this layer, right? So everything, if I just paint bucket that color right into there, it's just coloring everything. And all the little texture is all just transparency based. So it just, uh, Fills that in just perfectly, whatever color I wanted to make it. And just go from there. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So let me see here. I want to 
I can think of the best way and we have to save this here. And then I have another question for yeah. you um, from John. Um, he had the brush question as well. Um, so he said, out of the many brushes available, how do you pick and choose? Is it trial and error? Or do you kind of go in knowing what you want to pick? Um, well, for me personally, having created a bunch of brushes that I specifically made to kind of represent or recreate a lot of the analog tools that I loved using so much, um, that makes it a lot easier because I know them pretty intimately and everything. Um, but there's a lot of times where I do go outside of my my bubble of my own personal brushes that I've made and uh, and kind of use some other ones or like search for for some other things to accomplish the thing that I that I want to a look that I'm going for or something that mine aren't really kind of cutting it for. Um, and so you know that can be can be can be tough sometimes. So I mean, it depends on what it is that I'm trying to accomplish. And really, it's it's usually just a lot of of trial and error of trying different brushes and sketching something out. Um, a lot of times it's it's literally like, oops, I got a different tool and a different color here. So if I like, I have this this brush here, I'm still in the wrong thing. And I'm on a hidden layer. It's my first time. Um, so I'll just kind of like play with it. Grab another brush here. Let's see, Sign Painterly is one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. I'll just kind of see, I'll just do a lot of that or like, I don't know, just not really trying to do the thing that I'm working on necessarily. I'll just kind of experiment Let's with all of something mm -hmm. on there and see what, see what it looks like. Um, and just kind of like decide from there. Um, and yeah, it can be, it can be tough. There's so, so many options out there obviously now for, for whatever app or whatever style you're trying to, to use. So, um, yeah, it can be can be a little overwhelming sometimes it's you know it's it's also pretty fun in my opinion to to play around with with any and everything and see how uh, how things shape up and how you like them um and how they suit whatever it is you're you're trying to do mm -hmm. now is it um john had a follow-up question is it easier to create your own brushes is that easier um it can be. Um, for me, it was because uh, the things that were available uh, that were built into to this app or that app, whatever, were um, were fine, but not quite getting exactly to where I wanted to get with um, with what I was trying to do. So sometimes, a lot of times, a lot of the first brushes that I created were uh, just starting with an existing brush or one that I found from someone else and kind of tailoring it to do more of what I wanted it to do um, that I didn't feel like it was doing uh, for me. So um, that can be really helpful to kind of get yourself a nice little collection of, of really custom, custom tailored brushes really quickly is to kind of just find ones that are close and manipulate them in the ways that you feel like get them closer to what, you, what you're looking for or what um, is more helpful or fun to work with for you. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that can be, be really easy to to do to start out and then you know having your own is always there's always a, a fun feeling to that too right like, right <laughs> so. picking your name for the brush is is a great feeling yeah. i'm sure yeah yeah i know a lot of people tell me like the hammer king brush was like their favorite brush out of my out of my set so i'm like yeah you just keep using it keep telling people that that's fine. right 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 yeah. um, i will say um ryan gary in the chat said i was using procreate but I will have to try Fresco. So you've been teaching really well today. A lot of great apps out there for sure. But um, yeah. yeah, there are definitely uh, a lot of things that that some have over the others. And, um, you know, you can use them in, in conjunction with each other too and, and get a lot of awesome things accomplished. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, there's just, uh, there's so many ways that you can use these things and, and that are a little bit, you know, outside of the the ways that they seem like on on the face of them are the ways that they're supposed to be used, right? Like you can really, um, right, jumping into here so I can use um, Illustrator now. Here is all I'm talking. I'm like not doing good at talking while I'm doing that. <laughs> um, you see my, my Illustrator do. screen now on the computer, I assume? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Cool. So I will just grab... I've got a, a document created already here, which is again, a square. 
Um, and I've got a, a black square uh, layer filled in there and locked so that I can kind of drag in my, my lettering and start vectoring it in here. I'm gonna take my drawing glove off. Um, another tip when drawing on the iPad and, and whatever app it is, um, I always love using just this little two finger glove a bunch of different brands make them now um and originally they were they were made to keep you from smudging your your sketch on right. paper mm -hmm. with pencil but uh then people kind of quickly realized that it was also very helpful for drawing on screens whether it be uh, a wacom tablet or ipad whatever the case may be um you know just being able to move more freely on there on that glass than you otherwise can with the skin of your hand right right uh, it's mm -hmm. doing things especially like this where you want that smooth uh fluent movement um to be you know a little bit easier so right very uh, true all right so i am taking this skin right here and we'll bring it over to Illustrator. All right. So you saved your work um, that you did in Fresco, and you're going to open it up in Illustrator. Yeah. Let's see here. It is always fun to try and move this over here. Let's see. Mm -hmm. I'm not seeing myself on air drop. Peg asked the question, could you cut up a vinyl glove to make one? Um, depends on what kind of vinyl you're talking about. Um, I'm having trouble picturing a vinyl glove that uh, isn't, that is something that would work on glass or move freely or maybe i'm just being ignorant i don't know but i mean there's probably a lot of gloves you could use i mean you could <laughs> cut the the fingers off or you could use the whole glove honestly the fact that it's a two finger one isn't super important other than <laughs> having your your drawing fingers free for for actually handling the pencil but um but yeah i mean you can do uh you could do probably most kinds of gloves and most materials and and uh and work just fine as long as they move smoothly across glass that's really the, the key right. is, uh, is keeping a little bit of like input uh restricting so that you're not accidentally hitting things but um and you know mostly for me uh, the ipad does a pretty good job of that on its own right uh of rejecting palm input and stuff like that but um uh yeah oh i know why it's because i'm not on wi-fi that it's not letting me send it doop, 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 doop. Okay. Oh, there's my dogs. <laughs> outside. Oh, how many dogs do you have? Okay, here we go. Here's the here's the end of the conversation. There's one. Um, we've got three dogs and four cats. And oh is... wow. <laughs> that is when we're not um, fostering kittens, which we've been doing pretty much exclusively since um, since the pandemic started. We started wow. fostering kittens, and so we are we just actually got rid of the last of our last litter that we had here. Um, and at the time we had them, we had five kittens and their mom, and so we had what uh, seven plus six. We had yeah uh 12 living 13 jesus 13 <laughs> living animals in the house <laughs> in addition to our family of four so um yeah super fun wow that's amazing <laughs> Ooh, that's a lot <laughs> it is a blast yes i'm sure i'm sure it is i'm yeah. sure it is um, and since we're in the last 30 minutes of the live, if you do have any questions for Ryan, definitely leave them in the chat and I'll be sure to ask them. Yeah. Okay. Let me hear you. All right. Grab this artwork here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're 
very sand, but then it can... You don't want to go outside. It's super hot out there. I promise. <laughs> right. He'll be... He'll want to come back inside. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yes. I mean, we know. I'm so sad. Okay. Flat based. I'm getting... Trying to get creative here because it's not letting me, uh... Do the ways that I normally do things to to share things because of uh, my computer not being on Wi-Fi. <laughs> so I'm like brain farting and trying to figure this out here. Okay, so now we do this. Paste. Ramps. Rob said not to overstep, but he could send directly from Fresco to AI in the share menu. Yes. Okay. Here we go. Yep, I'm doing it in an annoying roundabout way here because already had this uh document set up and I'm trying too hard to stick to the, <laughs> the way that I had it set up here. <laughs> Again, like I don't need any help uh getting distracted from from things for sure and yes. being live is a uh, another fun way that I can really set myself up for failure. Okay, so now <laughs> I've got this guy in here. And thank you for that suggestion from the chat by the way. All right, so I want to drop the opacity down of this guy. Mm. And because I've opened this new one, now I've got no black background in there. So let me add that back in as well. And get this iPad out of the way. Keyboard background here. I was like, uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting to work from an iPad and then from the computer while not moving my camera all around. So, right. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Let me add in my the adventures of going live yep. <laughs> and drawing and speaking at the same time. time. Yeah. Right. Fine. <laughs> I'll do great, and then yeah, you realize. Oh wait, I don't do all of this all the time. That's for sure. Okay. <laughs> Whatever. Put that there. Change that though. Put it below. All right. Now we're going to gas. Okay. So I'm just going to want that whole layer at this point and add a new one on the top. I like working uh, with uh, a red layer for some reason. I don't know why. It's like a, a long time thing that I've done that it's just like is necessary for me now. And I want to move. Interesting. Okay. Um, yeah. So like if it's, if my handles are blue or something, like I'm, it throws me off now. I don't know. It's probably dumb. <laughs> it's like you get used to working a certain way and then you're just, you're locked into it. Okay. I'm so true. I mostly transparent uh, layer down here. I've got a new layer on top. The other one's locked. I've got my red layer two there. Um, <laughs> I want to make sure that I don't have this black fill and I will put a, a white stroke on this and I'm about to leave it nice and small. This is, I think, 2,500 by 2,500, I think I said, on this size. So um, or I might have made it for 4,000 by 4,000 when I finally moved it up here. But either way, the white stroke is going to be nice and small. And so mm -hmm. what I'll do is I'll just come over here to this this first shape. And um, sometimes, depending on texture that you're using or the transparency of the actual artwork itself, um, this could be a little bit too dark. Um, I'm just going to kind of demonstrate a couple ways that I do this. So. That'll be fine for, for this. It's going to start at about this corner. And I want to talk about keyboard shortcuts while I'm doing this because they are a total game changer once you get the muscle memory down for them. Um, mm. And something I always like to mention in preferences, oops, settings, um, selection and anchor display. So there's a default setting that is not 
the most helpful setting for drawing letters. And I always like to point this out. Um, this guy right here, constrained path dragging on segment reshape. That is not checked by default. And I always recommend absolutely changing it. And I'll show you why. Let me go and uncheck it real quick and show you what happens when I go to draw a curve. So say I'm drawing this curve here. Oops, get off, new curve. Got these handles here and say I'm doing this here. So we got just 90 degrees difference, whatever. Um, if I wanna modify this curve here, I can definitely hold command and move these handles individually for sure. But what I like to do that saves a ton of time is I like to just hold command and grab this. But mm. by default, what it does is it moves those handles. So you end up doing all kinds of crazy stuff and you end up changing the angles that these handles are coming from, which is not what you want when you're talking about drawing type and lettering. Mm -hmm. So if I go back to my settings, selection and anchor display, I check that box, constrain path dragging on segment reshape. You might want to screenshot that if you're watching in the chat. All right, so now get these back to where I had them, which was in this case, just straight up and down and straight left and right. Now, if I hold command, and move this guy. Oh, yeah. Those are constrained as I drag them. So I can put the points where I want them, put the handle angles where I want them, and then I can move this guy around wherever I want. And those things are going to stay the same, which is super, super helpful because, you know, if you've learned about drawing and vector and things, you know, a lot of people will, will stress the importance of putting your, your Bezier points at length, at points of extrema, right? Or, you know, your very, very furthest north, south, east, west, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and that is like doubly important, I feel like personally for, uh, for lettering because uh, it can really, really change your ability to make a certain kind of curve or something um, if they are not where you want them or more importantly, not at the angles that you want them. Mm -hmm. and it can just really, really make things a lot more difficult than it needs to be. And having the ability to do that. That's a great tip. Super helpful. That's a helpful tip. So um, Dan in the chat, they asked, do you ever try and use the blob tool? Um, br I, blob brush, I'm sorry. Right. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't really, for whatever reason, I've never practiced and gotten any good at drawing directly into Illustrator or Photoshop with, um, you know, especially not my mouse, but, um, or even like graphics tablets, the iPad, whatever. Um, I've occasionally tried to, but usually what I end up doing with, with things like that is using, you know, my, my iPad or, you know, in the past, a, a Wacom tablet to like clean up sketches and stuff. <laughs> it's like the extent that I've ever done with like actually drawing into, these apps on the desktop, um, it could definitely be, you know, a super easy way to, to do this kind of thing if you really got good at it. But I have spent so much time personally getting fast at <laughs> doing things this way to okay. where like it would take me so long to get anywhere near as quick at doing that um, and like fine tuning the brushes to do exactly what I wanted to do and respond to my pressure in the way that I want to and all that stuff. Like it just sounds like a surefire way to just really upset myself at this point. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah. I mean, if you're really good with, with drawing and, and into Illustrator, then something like the black brush could be a way easier uh, approach to getting like, especially this, this contrast of thin and thick areas uh, in a lot quicker way. Um, yeah, just, it would be very hard for me. Um, so as you can see here, I'm like, I'm kind of putting the points where I want them. Mm -hmm. And then in places like this, where you've got like an S curve, uh, um, so to speak, where it's, you know, kind of, they're both straight horizontally, but, um, you know, that is a little trickier to grab the actual path itself. Like I was talking about, but in something like this, where I'm going from here to say, here, instead of manipulating those handles, I can just hold command, grab this path, and put it right into place. Wow, so smooth. And it's so much easier. Mm -hmm. That looks so simple. Just end, that end, just end, that end. And take forever. 
sometimes they'll even just go through the whole whole shape without even manipulating the curves and just kind of put the points all where I want them. And then go back and, and do the curve. And... Oops. Accidental click. Um, a tip for shapes like this where they're kind of like that S-curve shape like I was talking about. Sometimes mm -hmm. it can be tricky. Like I could do just this point here and then put a point at the top and then kind of mess with these handles until they got close to where I want them. And you can get really, really close, especially um, depending on the severity of the the curves on that shape. Like that's pretty close to, to where I want, but mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to get this guy here, like to really dip in the way that I had it without doing like some really crazy manipulation. It's either going to be further away than I like here or here or whatever. So instead, one thing I like to do is kind of treat it like it is here. Let me see if I can do this live. Oh, um, I forget how to, oh, I'm selected on points. That's why. And just so you know, Ryan, you have 15 more minutes. Right. Mm -hmm. Redo, redo, redo. Okay. Back to pen tool. Um, I'll kind of treat a curve like this like it was horizontal and similar to the way that I did it on the first side of this, where I kind of put them at like the lowest point here and the lowest point here as if I was looking at it sideways. I'll kind of do that over here as well. So I'll put one like right, oops, not in the same shape. Put one over here, somewhere right in there, and then same place up here. And then I'll kind of, and these you kind of just have to manipulate the handles individually there. Mm -hmm. And then finish that guy off. Um, and I, yeah, I can't stress learning and uh, figuring out the keyboard shortcuts enough. Um, it's just a total game changer with speed, especially if you know how the modifier keys modify your, your pen tool. Because like you could go and reselect the select tool and come back and, and fiddle with these Bezier curves all day long, but um, you can also just stay in the pen tool and hit command or hit command and shift or command alt on a Mac um, and accomplish the same things a heck of a lot quicker. So I've got that shape and I want to get that top shape done as well real quick here. Wow, that was very quick. Could have been quicker too if I wasn't talking and distracted. Right, right. <laughs> right. Plot these points here. And fly through it a little bit here. Um, I'm holding option here to kind of break that handle in the middle of of drawing it. Mm -hmm. A good shortcut to learn and then yeah i mean once you you figure out what they do and just like if you just try and force yourself to keep using them and keep doing them and not cheat and like go switch tools and stuff like that if you just like force yourself to figure it out maybe slow at first until you kind of get that muscle memory down but like now i mean i'm i just got my hand on the keyboard and i'm looking oh at yeah screen. you're speeding through it for for sure i don't need to even look anymore you get the hang of it like you know, a lot of people wow. use uh, other apps and stuff for, for vector drawing. And like, I tell people all the time, like, I mean, yeah, I could, there's, there's probably apps that are like better built for doing this or that or whatever in vector, or at least more purpose built for, for other things than like illustrator was initially intended for or whatever, like all the arguments people make. Um, but I just, I just say like, you know, the, the amount of time it would take me to get as fast as I've gotten at doing vector drawing in Illustrator with the way the shortcuts are set up and the way these tools work, it would just, it would be such a waste of my time and, you know, ultimately money to try and catch up. In right, else. right. So, um, yeah, so I always recommend like, you know, learning this and get really, really good in, in one app or the other and, and just kind of let that be your, your 
superpower here. Um, so that is one way to draw them. And I think I've got like five minutes left. Is that right? About? So you have like 10 more minutes left. Okay. I wanted to make sure we didn't have like stuff built in in the end or something like that. Okay. So if I take, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. So I'm going to go ahead and swap those so that we can see that shape. Pretty decent. I like that. Um, That's beautiful. I want to show one other way that I like to draw, especially like higher contrast lettering like this, where there's like very small, thinner areas and then heavier, thick areas. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes this is not the the best way to to draw those, or at least the, the fastest way. Um, sometimes you can really do it um, quicker using kind of like a single stroke along the, what I call like the skeleton of each shape. Um, so let me create a new layer and I'm going to go ahead and change that color to red. Because I'm a freak. All right. Um, so there we go there. And I've hidden my other one. And this is really, really helpful for lettering where the, your thin areas are like really thin, like hairline, um, type lettering. Mm -hmm. Um, but it can really be, be useful for this too. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to, I'm going to work with, uh, this OR shape here for this example. So I can quickly kind of show you because it's got a little bit of a thinner area there than the F is. So um, I've got my pen tool and I'm going to start like kind of in the same way that I actually drew these strokes with the, the brushes in Fresco. And I'm going to kind of just like draw and I'm going to have to switch to that because I don't want it to be white fill. Flip. All right. And I'm going to just draw along what would be the, like I said, the skeleton stroke of these letters. Mm-hmm. And come up here. I'm gonna be a little looser with my placement and my adherence to like do north, do south, and whatever, just to kind of get through here with less points. But um, okay, there's that one. Broke my path. Okay. Get them. Come up there. And I would obviously spend a little bit more time in these placements more perfect, but you know, this will work. Mm hmm. Yeah, this will work in the last three minutes you have left. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So, the tool that I want to talk about that uh, I think a lot of people initially, when it first came out, thought, ooh, this could be like a major game changer for, for lettering especially, but then in practice, like didn't kind of, we're kind of underwhelmed by how helpful it was for this kind of thing. But I made a point um, a long time ago to figure out how to make it work for me. Um, and so that is the, the width tool. This guy right here, Shift W will take you to the width tool. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this, this path that I drew, I'm going to up the stroke weight to roughly the weight that I want those thin areas to be. Okay, and then I'm going to duplicate that layer. I'm just gonna copy and paste in front. Okay, so now in layer three, I've got two of those. I'm gonna lock the underneath one and work with the top one. And this is how you make this width tool work for this. The key is you want to go through first and choose where you want your thin areas to reside within and mark your your width points uh in those spots so for instance this is thick here and then it needs to like thin out by about here mm -hmm. double click put a point there when i come through it needs to start getting thicker again right about here double click put a point there stop getting thick about here double click Put a point there. If you double click, it's going to add a width point at that spot, but not change anything. So then I'm going to come up here and I'm going to do it again, maybe right about here before it starts getting thicker again. And then we'll say like right here where we want it to kind of taper off again. Okay. So now I've got those there. Nothing looks different, right? So what I want to do now is I'm going to come into these areas where it's supposed to be thick, like say like right here, and I'm going to drag that out. Oh, gotcha. Oh, now, there you go. what happens is the tool wants to like smooth things out and like move the the weight of things like kind of evenly across the the path. 
But what you want to do actually is to stop at a place where you want it to stop, which in this case for me is right here. So mm -hmm. now I come up here where it's supposed to be a little thick as well. Drag that out. And then say like right here, drag that out. Wow, that's now, nice. And I'll usually like uh, change these to like rounded terminals on the stroke. So do that. That way it's not a blunt end like that. And now I've got this. So the reason that I duplicated my layer though is because let me hide that underneath layer here. Remember how I said it kind of smooths out that width change that you wanted to make along the, the length of the path. So mm -hmm. if I didn't do that, then it like wants to keep getting smaller past that point that I made to the point where it's, let's see, like 11 pixels instead of the 20 that I had it set out here. And then here it's even smaller, right? It's like nine or 10. Mm -hmm. But if I have that other layer underneath it, it's never smaller than 20 where I had it set. And you know, the number is irrelevant. Like it just depends on the size of your document, obviously, or whatever, but um if you have that a kind of dual layer system then you can always have it just only go down to as, as small as you want it to and then you can kind of play with the, the heavy parts as much as you want and it's not going to make those smaller parts look really wild and crazy which is kind of what naturally happens because of the ways that it's trying to kind of stretch out and smooth those transitions out for you wow you, you, you so, did that in like five minutes that is so crazy <laughs> it makes it speeds up like especially lettering like this it speeds it up quite a bit and so wow what i can do is just kind of expand these guys right uh, and then this has been such a pleasure ryan oh my gosh it was so great having you on here it is always fun to be on w live yes thank you guys so much in the chat for joining us for chatting with us and have um Ryan answering questions. We really enjoyed the time. And we can't wait to see the finished look, Ryan. Hopefully you'll post it on your Instagram or something like that. Absolutely, yes. Um, it'll be for a single, we talked about music earlier, and it's one that I am uh, recording. So I'm going to be 40 next year. So awesome. 40 bars under 40 um, play on words. I so. love it. I love it. <laughs> we can't wait. We can't wait to hear it and see it. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Of course. Good to have everybody here. Thank you for joining us. Thanks, guys. Bye.